read it in English, and occasionally I comment that I don't like the translation. I do this because it's not a Hebrew class. We work on translating all the Hebrew words. Why are we always talking Hebrew in the classes? Well, I'm not doing <laughs> Especially me. You're free to ask whatever you want to do. I'm reading the English. This, then, is the meaning of the scriptural text, for it is exceedingly near to you to do. Okay. Okay. As I said in the introduction, the entire time is centered around a verse. Um, it is very close. This thing is very close to you, in your mouth and in your heart to do it. And now that we have finished all the stuff that we've learned, which we can actually learn because that was from previous semesters, now we can understand this verse. Now. The issue was, if you recall, that the approach that had been dealt with earlier in the time, up to chapter 20, up to, ch up to chapter 17, was that one is able to bring around throughout the proper feelings towards Torah amidst the service of God through contemplating Hashem's greatness, and that is made possible due to the godly soul. The godly soul has the power to achieve that. The problem is that that is not something that is exceedingly close, not very close, not karev ma'od, because that would imply that it has no restrictions or limitations. So instead, beginning in chapter 18, a new approach was discussed, the idea that we have an innate love for Hashem. How is that innate love for Hashem explained? The verse says as follows, for at any time and moment, a person is capable and free to rid himself of the spirit of folly and forgetfulness and to recollect and awaken his love of the one God which is certainly latent in his heart without any doubt. Okay. So we're going to stop here. Um, what does that sentence say? I know, it's not fair. I have to think. Where are we? At the beginning of the chapter. Well, it seems pretty obvious. Yeah, so tell me. That well, no, no, I know I'm wrong. But no, it could be very obvious. Maybe, maybe you're just right on target. <laughs> um, that a person is at any time able to like stop acting in a silly way. Meaning, like, it said that the only per reason a person would do anything wrong is if this rochstus, like this, how do you try to rochstus? They call it the spirit of folly. It's like a weird translation. Yeah. Like, yeah, spirit of like utter stupidity. Yeah, okay. utter stupidity comes over you, so a person has um, control over that and is able to come out of that whatever he wants. How? You can say that. By love, yeah. loving God. By fi uh, like getting in touch with that part of yourself that that has that unconditional love for God. Right, but the reason let's go to the back. The reason why the person doesn't behave as they should is because the spirit of folly or the spirit of utter stupidity, or the how you want to put it, uh, causes a person to uh, forget and not be in touch with that love, right? So in order to get the love, I have to remove the spirit of folly, right? That's the, it's, it's, it, it, it has like a, um, if you want to think of it physically, right? When you go to the dentist and they give you that shot of Novocaine to numb you, right? That's where the doctor can, the dentist can do stuff that would normally hurt, but you don't feel it, you're desensitized, right? The spirit of the world, it desensitizes you, right? So you need to remove that to rediscover, to reawaken, to reclaim that love, right? That make sense? Okay. So how do I get rid of it? How do I get rid of the world? How does it disappear? How do I, it says I'm free to do it at any time, right? How? But if it doesn't go away, you just like fill your time with other things. But that's not what the text says. Oh, I know. That's just my like important, like idea, which is like nothing compared to this. I know your ideas are very important. Oh, thank you. Uh, you should write a book, and then maybe you could have yeah. someone teach your book. Mm -hmm. Lots of people do that. But we're gonna, right now, we're doing this book. Oh. So the question is, what did the sentence say? Right? You, it says you're you're a person is capable and free to rid themselves of the spirit of folly and forgetfulness. Okay, how? Awaken his 
no, that's not going to work because the way this because Torah mitzvahs is the result, right? Once I feel connected to my sense of my Jewish identity and my love for Hashem and I want to connect, that will motivate me to do the Torah mitzvah, right? And the reason why I'm not doing that is because the spirit of folly desensitizes me, and I'm not and I'm touched with that, right? So I need to get remove the spirit of folly, remove the rashtos, remove the spirit of utter stupidity to reclaim that. How do I get rid of it? By awakening this love. Which is present without any doubt. I don't know, meditation? Meditation? No, it says, well, now we've got a problem, because if there's meditation... If there's me- it's one thing at that. If there's meditation, then, then I'm going to need to be able to meditate. So, like, one second. Can I meditate isn't that like, at any time and moment? Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I have a busy yeah. life. Awesome. Yeah, but you can do whatever you want, like when or hear your feet. Whenever I'm free, but the thing is, I'm not always free to, you know, spend 15 minutes and meditate and ponder and things. In fact, that was the reason we got into this mess to begin with. Because if I was free to just sit and contemplate, you know, godliness and divinity and purpose and meaning and blah blah blah, then I could just go back to, you know, contemplating God. I don't need this whole. Thing. I what? That's true. I agree with you. What's the problem with that? Does God want me to prioritize meditating over anything else? In other words, I have a wife, I have eight children, I have to teach, right? That's where it takes a lot of time. I'm supposed to sleep. Right? We can talk about that some other time. Okay? So, you're right. Now, it would be nice if the power of the evil inclination in the animal soul, which thrive on the effect of the rush, just works into my schedule, that only on those periods of time, when I have the time to contemplate, to remove the spirit of folly and utter stupidity from me, does it come and bother me. But unfortunately, the spirit of folly comes and bothers me all the time in all sorts of areas where I actually do have to, like, I don't know, help my child with their preparing for their test tomorrow, or I have to um, do grocery shopping, um, or we have guests coming and there's 20,000 things that you've got in the fifteen minutes before camera. Right? These things really exist in real life. You know, it's true that when a person is at a certain stage in life, um, they have a luxury of arranging their life around their own spiritual ups and downs. So it's usually when they're much younger and very when they're much older. But most of life isn't actually like that. And the whole point here was that it's it's Anybody can do this. Anybody has this ability. And, it's, and he emphasizes at all times at any moment. Like, he doesn't even say one of those expressions. He says both of those expressions. Right? And, and if you want to go back to chapter 18, which I know you don't really have because you have copies and I have the book. But the chapter 18 starts that even the person whose understanding and the knowledge of God is limited and has no heart to comprehend the greatness, right, and therefore cannot generate a love of fear, you know, even in their mind, right? That's where you get contemplation meditation. So I don't know, like, this I need something, you know, on the spot right now. How do I get rid of the spirit of father? How do I get rid of the spirit of utter stupidity? How do I resensitize myself in the moment? There must be like some like quick thing that you could tell yourself to just mm-hmm. knock yourself back in. Yeah, what do you, what do you tell yourself? Oh. He wants to read that. I want you to think. It's more fun for us to use our minds and explore an idea and try and figure out how it works than for just someone to like, you know, tell you a piece of information. I'm going to get like an inner feeling when you're doing something wrong. Like, you know that it's wrong. Okay, good. Okay. Let's, let's, first, let's first stop there. When it says that you're able to, um, at any time in the moment, to free themselves from the spirit of folly and forgetfulness, right? the does that mean that literally you can stop yourself from doing anything? Well, you have to know that it's wrong, right? No, if I'm going to stop myself from doing I have to know that it's wrong, right? So we're dealing within a certain range of things. So let's just use an extreme example. If you have someone who grows up and they don't, without any sort of um, religious education, they have no sense of that keeping kosher is a real thing that's an important thing at all. Totally forms them, right? Can they... Can they use whatever we're going to discuss to at any moment just get themselves to be fully committed to keeping kosher just in a moment? Why? Because because for themselves they don't have any sense that that's an important thing, right? So we're dealing with a situation where on some level you know for yourself the right and the wrong, right? 
but you're not sensitive to it because of this rashtas, the spirit of awe, this bit of, of utter stupidity, however you want to put it, right? Okay. So, that's good. Let's keep going. Now wait. Okay. On the one hand, I know it's wrong, but on the other hand, it really doesn't bother me that much because like, I'm possessed by this spirit of impurity, of folly, I'm not sensitive to it. I don't really feel how much I love Hashem. I don't feel how important this is in connecting me to Him. Even on some of I know that that's true. So now what do I do? Okay. So now I'm going to be a little nitpicky on the Hebrew translation. Um, one of the words that he uses is reshus or reshut, which it appears translated as free. You're free to. Is that what? No. What? No. No. No, it should doesn't mean that you're free. It, that's right. It doesn't mean that you're free. Oh. Although, although you, although it can carry that meaning in different contexts. For instance, someone could say, um, "Can I have a shoot to go to the bathroom?" And person have a shoot to go to the bathroom, and it wouldn't be wrong to say you're now free to go to the bathroom. Oh, but that's not really the meaning of the word. So what is the meaning of the word? <laughs> Permission. See, but even there, it's not really the real meaning of the word. It, it can carry that meaning. Okay? Um, anyone here speak modern Hebrew? Okay, one person. Okay. Um, what other words are similar to the word reshut? No, no. no. The same word, but the same, the same root, the same root, but... Other words in modern Hebrew, with the same, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Is it tough, tough here? Reish, shin, tough. 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 It's the word for authority. The word reish, means authority. So for instance, you'll sometimes think about, um, uh, um, the, the Rishiyot, the Rishiyot are the authorities, the government authority figures or, or arms of the government. Um, um, how do you say, a li- how, when the government gives you authorization to do something, right, a li- licensing, Rishui, Rishayon, Rishui, okay? Um, the, um, in Halacha, when we speak about the idea of like, so a public domain and private domain and the laws of Shabbos, you're not allowed to carry from the public domain into the private domain or the pu- private What is the word for domain? Rashut. Rashut. Like, Rashut means this is under my jurisdiction. I get to be in charge of this. That's what the word means. So if I'm in charge of whether my students, not in this class, obviously, but my students go to the bathroom, and then they ask for Rashut, what are they asking for? That, it should, that decision should come from me and be given over to them. Right? Does that make sense? In other words, Rashut carries with this notion of authority. You're in charge. Right? You don't get Rashut because somebody walks away and leaves you alone. You get Rashut because the one who had the authority gives you the power to make the decision. Okay? Think about it if you have an election, right? So there's a government office that has a particular um, you know, authority, whether in the United States it's the president or in Israel it's the, the head of the government, the Rosh Hashanah, it doesn't matter what it is, right? They don't have, they're not free to do stuff because no one's telling them what to do. It's the opposite, right? There's a certain authority and they're being given that authority. And because they have that authority, it's up to them. It's in, it's in their domain to decide how that power is going to be exercised, right? So what does it mean that you have Rishut? What does it mean that you have Rishut? Rishus. It means you have what? Power. Power. You have power, you have authority. Over who? Yourself. Over yourself. Give me an example of a person who doesn't have power over themselves. What? No, 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 no. Slave does have power over themselves. A drug addict. A drug addict. I would say that a drug addict doesn't. Um, we'll talk about a slave for a moment. Um, it is not my job to teach comparative religion and philosophy, but there is something called Stoicism. Have you heard of Stoicism? It's a Hellenistic philosophy. It has a lot of things that are heretical to Judaism. It has certain things that are... Um, Compatible Judaism is also the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but one of the interesting ideas they have there is 
that even if you're a slave, you can still have freedom because you still have authority over your mind. You have authority over your mind. You have authority how you're going to write things. You even have authority to comply with your master's instructions, right? You can sh- you have authority to decide whether you can comply and, and avoid the beating or decide to accept the beating, right? You actually have a tremendous amount of authority even as a slave. And so once you embrace that, once you accept that, you can be autonomous and free under any conditions. Okay. Now, th- th- there is the truth in that idea. Okay. Um, on the other hand, um, when a person is addicted, whether they're I don't, again, I'm not a professional therapist or anything. When a person is addicted, very often what they're getting at is at least a subjective sense that somehow they don't have authority over themselves in this regard. When this issue comes about, somehow they're not in charge of themselves anymore. That's just how it feels like to them. Yeah? But not children. Eight year olds. So, yeah. Do they really have Rashid over themselves? No. No. They like, do that's, why we, that's why we have parents make decisions. Right? And, you know, we can we can talk about levels of this, right? There's bar bas mitzvah, there's teenagers, there's adults, right? So what does this text say? Yeah, at any moment, at any time, this spirit of folly and forgetfulness, that 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 sense of being not in touch with what's really important because you have a godly soul, that you can get rid of that. How do you get rid of it? Taking charge. By taking charge of yourself. Which means if you're looking for something to come in and save you, some trick, some technique, some some special magic formula, some way to inspire and motivate yourself, that's not going to work. To use an example of the idea, if you are tired and you're in bed in the morning, how do you get out of bed? You You decide to get out of bed, right? Until you make the decision, you will not get out of bed. And once you've made the decision, you'll for sure get out of bed. It's actually quite a binary thing, right? You can sit and go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and try to motivate yourself to get out of bed, and you'll not get out of bed. But the minute you decide to get out of bed, even if you skip all that whole process, what's going to happen? So you make a decision. And because you are within your own domain, you're under your own authority, once you make a genuine decision, guess what happens? You have to listen to yourself. Now, if I make a decision, that means you have to listen to me? Does it mean my wife has to listen to me? My kids have to listen to me? This is a problem that we, we face in life. We make decisions and we expect other people to respond to our decisions because we made a decision. That doesn't really work. So if I walk around with an attitude that I don't really have real authority over myself, I am a um, a victim of circumstance. I am subject to what comes over me. Right? I need something to motivate me. That's how I relate to myself. Will I be able to get rid of the spirit of fault? If on the other hand, I walk around with an attitude that at the end of the day, I'm the king of my own little castle. And that castle is me. Right? And if I decide, then those things that are under my purview, that are under my jurisdiction, that are my domain, they will respond. And one of the things that responds is, Apparently, the rush does. The minute you decide that, the, that this spirit of folly, this utter stupidity, this desensitization should not play a role in how I'm going to relate to myself and my life, it does not. And um, when can you make that decision? At any time. At any time and under any circumstances. Yeah. What falls under the category of rush? Very good. And anything that's not in line with Hashem? Well, well, there's actually two very specific things we're going to talk about, although this, this dynamic can play out also not in the context of serving Hashem, but we're going to be focusing specifically on serving Hashem and our relationship with Hashem. Before I answer that question, um, more specifically, which is in the, in the, in the text, um, Those are really, the, the, that's why you have two expressions. In the Hebrew, rishus means that it's your authority, it's your decision, and biyade means that you can actually make it happen. So for instance, um, if a judge sentences a person to prison, they have the authority to do that, right? But do they have the power to put the person in prison, like the actual power to make it happen? No. 
Most people don't say, oh, well, because the judge says so, therefore I just walked into the prison and, and locked myself in, right? Generally speaking, you have to have some sort of um, you know, police force, some sort of sheriff, some sort of marshal that, that, what, that actually takes the person into custody with the implied threat of or actual use of real force and then locks them in the cell, right? So in, com in com combination, the judge has the authority and then the marshal exercises it, has the power to make it happen, right? Um, so, let's say, for instance, on a, on a physical level, we have authority over our own limbs, assuming that we're normal function uh, adults, right? However, something could happen where we, we're not capable of exercising authority. God forbid a person breaks an arm, right? They can't do certain things with their arm. That's because their arm is outside of their authorities because they don't have the power to exercise that authority practically. So he's actually saying two things. It is really under our domains, under our jurisdiction ourselves, and... We actually have the power to make that happen. And so the decision is all you need. And I want to stop and talk a little bit about the decision because this is where we get into a bit of a problem. Decision making in, the, in this kind of way um, it's a very hard thing to do if you're not used to doing it. If you are used to doing it, it is a relatively easy thing to do. Okay? So think of this as, a, as like a muscle, right? If you exercise the muscle, it's stronger, and if you don't exercise the muscle, okay. Now, in order for this to work, you need to differentiate between two things. It doesn't mean you have to have this all formalized in your mind, but it just has to be experienced this way. Okay. So let's take a very simple example, okay? Let's say um, you're really angry and you want to say something nasty to somebody, which I'm sure never has happened to anybody here in this room, right? Okay. How do you make, how is it possible to make the decision not to say the nasty thing? You have to have a sense that the desire, the anger, the desire to say the nasty thing is not actually something that you identify as yourself. But there's just, so to speak, two aspects of you. There's the emotion and the, and the urge and the desire that it's propelling you towards. And then there's something else which is myself, which has authority over the way that desire is going to play out. But what if I identify with desire? What if when I say I'm really angry and I want to say this nasty thing, I mean in the sense like I fully identify with that. Then is there anybody, so to speak, overseeing to make the decision? No. Right? For instance, when we get highly emotional, we lose a sense of that kind of ourself over ourself, then we lose our decision making ability, right? Okay. So, in a weird kind of way, part of making a decision is learning to simultaneously accept. These are my feelings, these are my experiences, these are my desires, these are my fears, but at the same time, I am not those things. Because they're mine, so they're under my jurisdiction, but I'm not them, so I have, I have authority over them. And, and when a person lives in that, that kind of a space, then they can make decisions. When they're not living in that space, then what happens? They're a victim to however they feel. And is that something just overnight, all of a sudden, poof, you get good at? No, that's something that hopefully a person, you know, matures into as they come out of being a child into being a teenager. But, but that's what um, must be in place for this to be true. Right? I know you wouldn't go to a person who, 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 who has no sense of anywhere in life making decisions in that kind of way. I don't mean like choosing, like, do you want chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream? I mean the sense of, like, I feel certain ways. I have certain urges, I have certain fears, but at the end of the day, those, those are both mine, but not me. They're mine, so I have authority over them, they're not me, so I have the freedom to decide how I'm going to let them play out in my life. If a person doesn't have that sense of himself at all, and you just throw them this idea from the time, there's no like, there, there's nothing for it to rest on. And it's like if I give you a book in, in Chinese, you can't read it because you don't speak Chinese. There has to be kind of a, a psychological maturity, a sense of, of, a, of a self who takes responsibility for it but doesn't identify with how we experience things 
that you can then take this knowledge of the object of saying in the Tanya and apply it. Questions? That makes sense? Is the whole idea of mind over emotion? What? Is the whole idea of mind over emotion? It, 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 this is what, it, this is an aspect of it. This is an aspect of it that you know it, in our mind we don't just have a sense of some sort of you know objective truths that are true of us how we feel, but we also have a sense of kind of a, a, an authenticity to ourselves that I am not I, I am not defined by the experience that I am having. And what this allows us to do is when we make decisions when we're in that place we make decisions based on what's genuinely important to us our true identity in an authentic way. Um, and that's really how this works. Right? So when you said priority, that's why I asked you, because the, the answer is how do you how do you get rid of the spirit of folly? You prioritize. You don't prioritize time to do contemplation and meditation, because that's not a realistic solution. Right? Is that there's this sense of this is how I feel, but I am not defined by how I feel, and I get to, to, to decide how that plays out and, and if I let this dictate how I'm going to behave, it's going to go against the real priorities I have for who I am. And if that's how the person is approaching it, then it doesn't really depend on the time. It doesn't really depend on the circumstance. Okay? But that means that you end up carrying all the responsibility yourself. Which is kind of what the, the verse promises, right? It says, that the thing is very close to you. What do we say close meant? Remember what close meant? As opposed to being what? And if it was far, it would have to happen with the person is the first second introductory class. If it was far, you would have to send someone to go get it. Right? If, what does it mean as close? It's something that is under my authority, something that I can do for myself. So you have to now ask yourself, do you really want it to be close? And I, I would venture to say, I think this is an important point, not always, because if it's close, that means it's under your authority. So yeah, you can do it whenever you want, but it also means no one's gonna come and rescue you. And if no one's gonna come and rescue you, carry the responsibility, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or six, five days a year, right? I think they have a word for this now called adulthood. I'm not sure if that's really a word. Something along those lines. And this is why this is why we're bringing this up. Because what if you don't want the responsibility? That seems like you're leaving the night. That's right. And so this is why it's this is why in practice, even though it's so straightforward to not let the animal soul govern our lives, why in practice don't we all do it? Because what? We don't want, I don't want to have to bear that responsibility. So there's part of us who doesn't really take that responsibility, who doesn't really want to make the decision, is hoping that something will come around and save us from ourselves, and we get stuck. And so there's like a decision to make a decision, if you will. There's a decision to accept the responsibility that I'm the only going to make the decision. And I'm going to have to figure out how to live with that decision in a way that I don't feel crushed by the weight of that responsibility, right? So that's it. That's all you have to do. It's not so difficult. Actually, it is very difficult. It's not so. It's not. It's not complicated. That's the answer. It's not so incredibly complicated. Okay. Any questions before we go on to answer to answer exactly what the Ruach Shkus is is doing? I said there's there's an answer to that. It it affects two things. One is our love for Hashem, and the other is our realization of the effect of doing the mitzvahs in connecting to Hashem, or conversely, the effect of sinning and separating from Hashem. Exercising this? What? Exercising this? No, that's what the Ruach Shtos does. In other words, when, I, when the Ruach Shtos, the spirit of folly, is affecting the person, the person is not, so to speak, forgets how much they love Hashem, and is not sensitive to the implications of doing mitzvahs and sinning. Now again, we're after talking about a person that on some level knows that this is nonetheless true. And what we're saying is that lack of sensitivity is not something that you have to figure out a solution for. You just have to realize that, you're not, that it has power over you because you're willing to let it have power over you. When you take responsibility for not for that, and decide it's not going to have power over you, you'll be able to resensitize yourself to that basically right away enough to make a decision that you wholeheartedly can stand behind. And then you're going to be serving the Shabbat. 
which is really like what we've done, right? Like why do you need more of a chapter? Right? So, okay. So it says to um, to rid themselves of spirit of folly and forgetfulness, and to recollect and awaken his love of the one God, which is certainly latent in his heart without any doubt. Okay. Now, um, again, the note on the translation. What does latent mean? It's there, but it's not expressed. It's there, and it's not expressed. Okay. Um, like it's dormant, like it's yeah. sleeping, right? Okay. But if you're if you're um, getting in touch with it, right, and tapping into it, resensitizing yourself, is it still latent? No. no. Okay. Now in the Hebrew, it does. It uses the word hamisuteris. Now, does anyone know the, the Hebrew the direct little translation of hamisuteris? Mm-hmm. Hidden. Hidden. Right. Now, with more specifically, more specifically. Um, we differentiate in Hasidus between things which are hidden and things which are concealed. Mm-hmm. What is the difference between something which is hidden and things which are concealed? Maybe concealed is like on um, the side of one or not meant to be found. That's right. Which one's not meant to be found? Concealed? No. <laughs> That's why you have to conceal them, because they're meant to be found. So, for instance, my thoughts are not concealed, they're just hidden. My thoughts are available to who? To myself. They're not available to you, so as far as they're hidden. Right? Um, that, the, the Hebrew word for this is usually used as hell. Whereas my words are revealed. But what if I don't want you to know what I'm saying? Then I have to find some way of concealing what I'm saying. I can say it in whisper, right? Or I can say it in code, or you know, write it down and you know, have someone else read it so you can to read it, right? I have to do something to prevent you from Anyway, right? Okay. But once once something has been uncovered, it's no longer concealed, right? So if you're removing the spirit of a follower, you're removing the spirit of stupid, utter stupidity, right? You're, you're not letting it control you, right? You made the decision not to have it determine how you're going to live your life, right, at that moment, then should it still be considered that this love of Hashem, which was previously being covered over, concealed, is still covered over concealed. Now, the spirit of folly is making me not sensitive to how much I love Hashem and how much keeping Torah and mitzvahs really affects my relationship with Hashem. Okay, and I make the decision not to let that really um, have an influence over me because it, and, and to re- reconnect to that other part of myself, that love of, the love of Hashem. Once I reconnect the love of Hashem, and I and I sense it, and I feel it, and I make my decisions based on it, because that's authentically what's important to me. Is it correct to say that this love is hidden? This love is concealed, even? No, it's, it's like, what do you mean? Okay. So why is it called a concealed love? Which one is it, hidden or concealed? I would say it's not hidden or concealed, right? No, but what is, for this one? He, here it uses the word mustatars, which means concealed. Okay. Now, earlier in Tanya, he explained why we call this concealed love. And he said the reason it's concealed is concealed in our animalistic instincts and desires when we're, when we're not engaged in the service of a chef. In other words, when I'm approaching life in a self-absorbed, animalistic way, where is that love of a chef? It's being concealed by the animal drives and the animal instincts, and, and, I don't, and I don't not touch with the spirit of folly, desensitizing to it, etc. But once I make the decision to break free of that, and to, and, and to realize that's what's really important to me. Is it being concealed anymore? So why is it called the concealed love? But we're talking about the person who made a decision not to be in denial. Okay. So there's a simple answer and there's deep answer. The simple answer is because normally this love is concealed. And so it's called the concealed love. It's called the, or if you want to be more, you want to be, it's called hidden love or latent love, but really it is, it's concealed. Because it's normally concealed. And in fact, it was concealed up until you made the decision to expose it, to reveal it, to, to, to live up on it. However, the, the deeper answer is that even when you make the decision, it's still concealed. Okay. And it is illustrated with, this, with the following example. Do you have a favorite food? If that favorite food 
is present. Do you have to make a decision to remember that you love that food? No. Why not? Because you just like it. If you have your friends, when you see your friend unexpectedly on the street, you have to make a decision to remember that this is my friend and they're important to me and they, I, I like having them in my life and I don't spend time with them. No. So how come you have to make this decision? Because even once you've made the decision, is it still the same way it is with food and friends? Right? It's not really... In other words, what you're saying is I'm acknowledging something that's true about me, but if it's not, it's still it's still being concealed because if it was if it was really revealed, I would just feel it. It would be part of my integrated experience of life, and that's not what's happened, right? Person um, is tempted into something ungodly because of the animal souls and temptations, and they're, they're, they feel like genuinely willing to go along with it because the spirit of folly is desensitizing them, right? And they make a decision not to let that 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 spirit of, of, of stupidity really affect that. And they're going to instead make a decision to live based on what they know is really important, right? Why does they have to make a decision based on what they know is really important? Like once you remove the spirit of folly, now you feel it. The answer is you still don't feel it. It, it. it takes the form of experience of things like prioritization, integrity, rather than just an actual feeling of love and desire. So that means the love and the desire is actually still being concealed. In other words, the shift between the person before they made the decision, after they made the decision, is a very profound shift in terms of how we behave, how we live, how we act, how we conduct ourselves. But it's not a profound shift in terms of how we're experiencing. It's not like one moment I totally forgot that I love Hashem. The next moment I make a decision, all of a sudden I'm overcome with a sense of connection and spiritual closeness. And that's not what happens. Okay. Um, have you ever had to study for a test? Mm -hmm. Have you ever pushed it off? But you knew it was important. And at some point, you realize, you make the decision that I need to start studying because if I don't start studying, I really won't be ready for the test. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does it now feel more important drastically than it did before you made the decision? Or, or do you just now take it more seriously that it's important? Mm -hmm. You see the difference? No, it's before you, you knew it was important, but you were kind of like, Pushing it away, you're not trying to think about it, distract yourself, right? It weighs on you. And then you say, you know, no, no, no more. I'm going to take it seriously. When I take it seriously, what am I doing? I'm acknowledging it's really important. I'm not going to let myself get distracted. But it didn't go from being unimportant to important. Now, sometimes that does happen. That's usually a different process, right? Like you have a kid who's failing in school and they just don't think it's important, they don't take it seriously, right? And, and the parents, the teacher, the guidance counselor comes and tries to get them to realize that this is a big deal. That's not an in the moment decision, right? Like, oh, well, I was totally blowing off school. It doesn't really matter. But now I'm going to be a good student. But the things that I'm going back to is like, oh, you know it's important. How do you relate to that knowledge? And the shift between before making a decision and after making a decision is that I'm kind of being sensitive to how important it is. I'm denying how important it is. I'm distracting myself from how important it is to acknowledging how important it is. Accepting that it's really that important. Being honest with myself is that important. But it's not like I'm overcome with the sense of, oh, this is the most important thing. Like, that doesn't radically change. And certainly when we talk about something like love, it's not describing all of a sudden the person goes from being having animalistic desires that would lead them away from Hashem to all of a sudden being overcome with the sense of love for Hashem. That's not something you can guarantee that every person can do in a moment. So on the level of how it feels, it's a very, very subtle thing. But on the level of personal freedom and autonomy, the level of how we act and how it plays out and how it affects our decisions, it's very profound. Okay. And this is another reason why people often don't do this, because we like drama, we like things that are exciting, we like things that are very impactful, right? If you're feeling kind of down and, and something makes you feel um, inspired or something makes you feel joy, right? Um, that's, that's something you want, it's something to connect to, it's something to resonate with, right? But if you're feeling kind of down, and the only shift is, well, no matter how down I feel, at the end of the day, I have the power to make this day a good day or a bad day, so I'm going to get out of bed, and I'm going to you know, do the stuff that I'm supposed to do. It doesn't feel that dramatic. Right? It doesn't feel like, what a radical change. It is a radical change. Like, uh, uh, like, conceptually, it's profound. It's deep. But, you, but it's not like you necessarily feel 
overcome with optimism and joy because all of a sudden you're doing this thing. It may be that if you start living the way you should live and you're more being you know, genuine with yourself, you'll feel more joy. That's a different idea. And so even, the, even once a person so speak, removes the spirit of folly, removes the utter stupidity, re-sensitizes himself right, with that decision, this love for Hashem is still really hidden. Right? Is it hidden to be that can never be revealed? No, it can be revealed. The standard way it gets revealed is um, in, moments of, in moments of extreme decision-making and self-sacrifice. Like, um, what? Yeah, yeah, like when, 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 um, when, you know, the choice is to, um, you know, give up your life or convert to Christianity, and all of a sudden you just have this intense feeling that you can't control, that I can't convert to, I can't, doesn't matter the cost of that, right? And that actually feels it. And that's not by the way, and that even doesn't feel like it is. That feels like something welling up within you and almost coming over you. That's, that would be being revealed. Great tzaddikim who refine themselves are able to create a place in their cycle, in their psyche that they can experience that desire in a kind of stable way. None of that is being, you know, offered here. This is simply saying there is a deeper truth about myself that I can be, I can be an acknowledgement of, I can, I can be honest about, I can prioritize, and when I take responsibility for myself to do that and make decisions about how I'm going to relate to how I'm experiencing things from that perspective. Then I'm able to free myself of the, of the of the negative effects of the spirit of folly, and draw upon this love for Hashem. But even at that point, the love for Hashem is still remaining, essentially concealed in my ungodly experience of life. I still feel like the same person. I still am drawn to the same things. I still have the same inhibitions, etc., etc., etc. None of that changed. Which again makes it much more accessible, right? Because you know, to, to radically change your whole experience of life from one thing to another thing in a moment, that, that doesn't sound realistic. So that's, the lack of how dramatic this change is, on the one hand, can make it seem like a very unappealing thing. All right, I, want, I want to go more. But on the other hand, it also makes it much more accessible. Questions on this before we continue in the text? Okay. This is the meaning of, of the words in your heart. Included therein is also fear. That is the dread of separation in any way from his unity and oneness. Blessed be he. Okay. Now, here again, we have a problem with the translation. How, does, if you read this in English, do you see the flow? Read it in English, right? This is the meaning of in your heart. Included therein is also fear. Like, what's the... There's no like real flow. The issue is, is that in your heart in Hebrew can be spelled in two ways. What are the two ways you can spell in your heart? With two ways, the or the They both mean the same thing. Ah, it means two hearts. There's two elements. So, for instance, when we say you should love Hashem with all your heart, it says. And our sages say that means both with the evil inclination as well as the good inclination, right? There's a notion that there's a double element there. And so that's where he's getting. There's an element, it's not just the love of Hashem, there's also a fear of Hashem present here. In other words, this innate love for Hashem doesn't just provide a basis to serving Hashem out of love, it also provides a basis for serving Hashem out of fear. Now, this is important um, for several reasons. Um, some of them are elaborated later on in the chapter, and some of them are not. So we're going to start with what's not, and then we'll move on from there. Why is it important to love Hashem? And before you answer the question, and you can answer the question, um, the question is being asked from the point of view of the Torah, not why I personally might want it to be important. Why would the Torah say that it's important to love Hashem? Hashem said it. Okay, good. What is what is loving Hashem a chok in the sense that Hashem commanded it, and there's nothing we're supposed to understand about why that's important. The Torah expects us just to do it out of blind. So, um, obedience to Hashem, like say not wearing woman in clothing, or is it more like not stealing, where Hashem expects us to understand what's wrong about it, or like tzedakah, where Hashem expects us to also understand what's right about it. 
No, you're right. We have to do. We have to love Hashem because Hashem said it. Loving Hashem is the law. You're required to do it in Judaism. Okay, but is it like the prohibition of eating milk and meat, or is it like giving tzedakah? Giving tzedakah, you're not just obligated to give tzedakah, you're also obligated to come to some sense of why it's proper and moral and good. Are we supposed to understand why love for Hashem is a good thing, an important thing? Okay, so why does the Torah want us to love Hashem? What is good about it? What are we missing if we don't have it, in other words? We're missing, like, our core part of ourselves. No, you always have to prepare yourself. The commandment to love Hashem is not to, is not to have something you haven't aching. Right? Like, it would be very weird if Hashem made a mitzvah. Thou shalt be human. Why would that be a weird mitzvah? Because you already are human. There could be a mitzvah, thou shalt act human, because we don't always act human, right? If you have an innate love for Hashem, you don't need a commandment to love Hashem. Right? The commandment to love Hashem is not just to have that love as part of your being, because that you get automatically. So why is it why is it important to love Hashem? It can't just be because it's an innate part of me. I mean, that's not a command. That's just a fact. Well, that is the main reason we were created. The main reason we were created. Yeah, because otherwise, then why would I do it with the Torah and its folks? It's a higher purpose because, like, it doesn't. Feel, a lot of the Torah and its folks doesn't necessarily feel good to the animalistic side of me, even though I'm in like. A material world. So if you love Hashem and you understand the higher purpose that you're elevating everything to, then that's important. That's why we we were created to elevate okay. ourselves. Okay. I want to pull apart two ideas that I think are including what you said. Um, if we're doing mitzvahs and we don't feel that what we're doing is um, important and meaningful. There's going to be some lacking in how we're doing it. That, that's an idea that I think is included in what you said, yeah? There's another idea, which is that if we don't feel what we're doing is important and meaningful, then we're not going to do it. That's a, that's a different idea. Okay. Let me explain the difference. Okay. Most of us pay, you know, our taxes. Not everybody, but most people pay our taxes. Okay, if you make money, you pay your taxes. Or your parents pay. Or your parents pay taxes, right? Yeah. But you, you, you will, God will, and eventually make enough money that you will have to pay taxes. Okay. Um, why? Now, I'm sure there are people in the world who feel a great sense of civic virtue and the importance of contributing your resource to the collective good, and therefore they pay taxes. And they, why do most people pay taxes? Because yeah. they have to. Now, the notion that they have to is so deeply ingrained. You know, it's not like the person saying, oh, I better pay my taxes, so otherwise the IRS will get me and I'll go to jail, right? That's not, that's not what's happening. Is that the law and the enforcement of law has created a sense of norm and expectation. In other words, because there's a law that says you have to do it, and the law is enforced, at least to some degree, that cre that creates some sense that this is something that if I'm going to like function in society properly, I should do this. And that gets so deeply ingrained, the person's not sitting there thinking, I'm afraid of not, I'm afraid of the consequences, right? They've been conditioned that this is something that they have to do as part of just being a responsible adult. Right? Now, does that mean they're really invested and enthusiastic? In, um, in filing your taxes and paying your taxes? Probably not, right? So now, is love meant to serve the role of getting us to do the mitzvahs? And the answer to this is, I'm not saying it can't, but it's not meant to. Why is it not meant to? Because that would mean that doing the mitzvahs really depends upon how I feel about them, rather than the fact that these are things that are expected of me. So where should the doing the mitzvahs come from? The mind. What? The mind. The mind. The mind senses like this is this is just what I have to do. This is how this is how you have to live, right? Um, to use a different example, let's illustrate the same point. Okay. I have a one and a half year old. He's very cute. Um, he. Still uses a bottle, because one and a half. Doesn't only use a bottle, but he uses a bottle. 
Um, and so sometimes um, I'm ready to go to bed and I'm tired, I'm ready to go to bed, or I'm already, or I'm already in bed, and uh, he needs a bottle. Sometimes it's a preemptive bottle, it's a preventive for him. Yeah. He's very cute. He's my son. And I love him dearly. <coughs> Do any of those feelings <coughs> serve as the driving force for me to evolve before I go to bed to get up in the middle of the night and make him evolve? He wakes up. I think so. I think so deep down. Uh, deep down is not, a, not important. <coughs> Because, because when we're talking about deep down, they're just things that are fundamentally true about us. The question is, what is it that comes to the surface, and what is it that you need to tap into? Yeah, there's two things. There's two things. One is one. You know, there's two things. One is relevant to our discussion. The other is not. But I'll mention both. One is um, and this is the me making the bottle before I go to sleep and retire. Is that I don't want to be woken up later. So that's entirely for me. Right? That's like you know. But the other one is what you said. He needs to eat. And if he needs to eat, someone needs to make him a bottle. And if it's the middle of the night, who's there to make him a bottle? There's me, and there's my wife. Unless I want to put it on my wife, then. Okay. Does that sound like things like um, fondness, desire, passion, or does that sound more like a sense of responsibility, a sense of business and some expectation, right? a sense of accepting that the world works a certain way? You know, and there's, there's a, it, it subjectively feels very different. Now, it could be, and this would get to a secondary thing, which is you could then come to resent that obligation, or you could then come to celebrate that obligation, right? It becomes, right? And that's where, the, that's where what you're saying, the deeper thing is, is outside of the actual experience itself, how do I then contextualize the whole thing, right? So he's hungry, he's a baby, he needs a bottle. He wakes up crying. He's not going to feed himself. I'm his father, right? So unless I'm going to make my wife do it, it's on me to make the father, right? Give it to me. So it's that sense that he needs to eat, and then, and there's the expectation of the parents to, to, to provide, and it's, and it's wrong to impose that on the other person just because you find it inconvenient, right? And that sense of decency and responsibility and norms and expectations is what motivates a person to get out of bed in the middle of the night and make a bottle. Now, does the person look back on that whole thing and feel resentful about it? That's where we tap into these things of you appreciate how that's a good thing, you love your child, or you see that's a valuable thing, right? And you can have a positive, you can love the fact that you have this responsibility. Right? But at the moment, what you're not feeling is feelings of love and death. This is very important because Lacidus is, is quite adamant that not all positive emotions, not all good feelings are under the rubric of love. The other, broadly speaking, we divide them into two. One is called love, and the other is called fear. Now, fear is a little bit, yeah. Okay, it's a little bit, it's a little bit broad, and um, the key difference between love and fear is fear makes um, demands of you. Okay. So. Within the broad rubric of fear, we would include things like a sense of responsibility and a sense of respect. Right? If I have respect for other people, that means I can't do whatever I want because it infringes upon their dignity. Right? So my sense of the other person's dignity right, demands that I act in a particular way, and I feel that in position. Okay? Now, that's not the same thing as running away from a tiger chasing you, but the common factor is reality is dictating how I am and I have to correspond to that, right? And I am in some sense, therefore, um, submitting to something beyond myself. And that's broadly what we mean by everything goes under the rubric of year or fear. In contrast, love is about, you know, a feeling of closeness, a feeling of fulfillment. It's connected with things like desire. It's connected with feelings of, of comfort and warmth. Um, Things, things associated with a sense of wholeness and completeness, a sense of expansiveness, a sense of, 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 of harmony. It's a very different type of set of feelings. And they have, and both of them have a place. If we don't have love, then when we're doing things, we're not fully invested in them. But if we don't have fear, 
then we're, so to speak, everything revolves around us and our desires. There's no sense there's anything more, there's anything significant to the outside of myself. In every relationship with another person, we need not talk about Hashem, the fear element is much more critical than the love element. What do I mean? I don't mean to be afraid of the other person. I mean, to basically, like, go back to think. That person is a human being. They created the image of God. They have a certain dignity. And you should be, feel afraid or inhibited of acting and treating them in a way that violates that dignity. That basic respect is much more critical to anything than how much you like them or want to be with them. On the other hand, what makes relationships really thrive, right, is not those fear-like things, but more the love, right? The feelings of closeness, the feelings of desire, the feelings of camaraderie, the feelings of togetherness, right? So when we talk about how Hashem wants us to do mitzvahs, does he want us to do mitzvahs realizing that mitzvahs are important and we're expected to do them? And it's not really, we're not, we're not God, we don't determine the reality, right? We, 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 want to, we want to create ourselves and determine what's, what's significant and what's insignificant. We exist in a world created by someone greater than ourselves with expectations and things that are important that we have to learn to come to accept and, 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 and live in accordance with. And that's a very important thing. Because otherwise, we kind of set ourselves up as, as kind of the center of the universe. We become the God. And that's why the fear is very important. But on the other hand, without, it, 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 without love, we're not really truly invested in the Torah mitzvahs. We're not present. We don't feel any real connection to them. They're not something that we um, feel as part of our lives and who we are. And so Hashem expects us to do Torah mitzvahs both motivated by fear and motivated by love. And now here's the problem. If my innate love for Hashem, my latent love for Hashem, my hidden love for Hashem is only love, then when I do mitzvahs on that basis by reminding myself how much I love Hashem and that's how I live my life, what have I done? I've corrupted the way I've related to Judaism because there's no sense that there's any value to this beyond the fact that how it fulfills my desires and my needs. And there's no sense that there's something important beyond myself. So there has to be some element of Fear. There has to be some element of 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 um, recognizing that I am not the end all and be all of them. And both elements need to be present in order for the service of Hashem to be properly to, to be done properly. The exact ratio, the exact balance, the exact forms that that can change. And so the author needs to insist upon is that this love for Hashem contains within an element of fear. Now, he describes this fear. And here the fear is actually fear. Fear. It's not respect. It's not responsibility. It's actual fear. What is it a fear of? Separation. Separation. Okay. Now, why? What? Why is it important to love Hashem? Why is it important to love Hashem? Because without loving Hashem, we're not going to actually be connecting to Hashem through the mitzvahs we do. Right? If, if I do things out of a sense of responsibility and obligation and duty, right? I'm not really becoming close to anybody in that. Like, there's, there's, I mean, imagine like you have a friend and your friend is always doing things out of a sense of deep respect and commitment and responsibility and decency and principle but but never any actually desire to be close to you never because they actually feel like they want you in their life would you actually over time feel close to them if they treated you that way it would probably be very uncomfortable if the framework of the relationship was a friendship now if they were if you were a queen and they were your and they were your servant your serf then, then maybe that wouldn't bother you right but but if you're your friend Okay, but here it's, here here he uses fear. The fear of God is actual fear. It's a fear of separation. Why is there? Why would the soul be afraid of separation? Because its duty is to get back to Hashem. No. I'm separate. What am I? What? I'm separate. What am I? I'm separate. What am I? I'm going to use an analogy. You're not you're not wrong. I'm using an analogy. Um, there's a phenomenon, it's not in 
it, it doesn't, it's not an absolute thing, but it exists quite frequently, that kindergarten teachers prefer that fathers drop off the children rather than mothers. That's statistical, we're not sure 100% of the time. Why would that be? Because the mother's like to linger and make sure that they're okay and give them hugs. And that can happen, there's another issue. Okay, like the kids I can, I mean, I've dropped off my, I've dropped off my kids in kindergarten, not as much as I like, but a lot of times I treat the children. And the amount of times that I had a kid crying because I, I left, I have a hard time remembering it ever happened. And it's a common thing, right? Whereas mothers, it's a very, it's a very good deal. Now again, that's, that's, that's not about specifically the issue of mothers or fathers. What I want to get at is, is something else, which is that when a person feels that their sense of who they are and their whole reality is defined in terms of someone else, <coughs> how do they experience separation from that someone else? Pain, loss of identity. What? Complete loss of identity. Okay, when you feel like a loss of identity, complete upending of reality, okay? Um, that's about as scary a thing as a person can experience. Now, when you're, when you're an adult, you don't tend to relate to other people that way for the most part. Right? Most of us have some sense of being an autonomous individual to some degree. We have people in our lives. But when you're like a, you know, a, a, a little child, you don't really have that sense of you have your life and people in your life. You actually more have a sense of what is the anchor point in your life? Your parents, and it tends to be more specifically. Your mother, doesn't, again, doesn't have to be. And the separation, they're not there. It's like... Who am I? Where am I? Everything just disappeared, right? And it feels very, very, very scary, very threatening. Right? Conversely, um, if you take your kids to the park and they're very little, um, they will they want you at the park. And when you're there and you pay attention to them, what you'll notice is this is again this is statistics, not like every child or anything, right? The child will 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 the more the parent is present the more the child will wander further away from the parent and for longer periods of time. And the more the parent is absent, the reverse is the case. Why would that be? What? Why? Why? Why am I like, They feel safe. They feel safe. They're anchored in reality. If my mother is on the other side of the park and she's aware of where I am, I know who I am, the place I am is safe, and I can explore and I can play an example. On the other hand, if my mother isn't really present, right, I feel unmoored, I feel like I don't have a sense of who I am and where I am in the world, so what do I have to do? I have to keep running back and get that. There's this, there's, now this is, as children mature, what's supposed to happen, everything works properly. It works perfectly properly. What's supposed to happen ideally? Right, right. There's this notion of right of separating from your parents, of differentiating yourself from your parents, and eventually becoming your own person, right? Which is a whole process, right? When someone gets stuck around, you know, some of the teenagers and it gets really messy, but whatever. Okay. On the other hand, what happens? Uh, this, what happens if you that place in a person um, come gets gets feels like they're being threatened even as an adult. So let's say you have an adult. And for whatever reason, they, 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 those feelings of being like a toddler whose parents have left and totally unmoored of no sense of who I am, what's going on, where's reality, how does anything make sense, right? What happens if that kind of a feeling, right, which we still have, we still carry out this as adults, what happens if that rises to the surface for whatever reason? What happens to that person? They shut down. What? They shut down. They shut down, they have another idea. Right? And if a person starts to feel that that's what's about to happen, are they pretty rational about how they make decisions at that point? Right? They start treating everything as if it's a matter of like absolute life and death, even though when you're looking at it from the outside, it's not. Okay. How does the godly soul's love for Hashem affect its sense of life in a way that's the catch from Hashem? Like that. Yeah. So the godly soul experiences every kind of detachment from Hashem as kind of an existential threat. And we know what happens if you actually feel existentially threatened, right? You shut down, you become irrational. 
And so, do you feel powerful? Do you feel in control of that place? Or do you feel like the real, the real, the real substance of reality is totally outside of your hands? And the person doing that work. Right? It's the opposite of feeling like you have control of yourself. The opposite of feeling like you're like you have autonomy. It's the opposite of feeling like you are empowered. Right? It, and, and you know, if a person, if a person is not, if a person isn't able to accept that they're limited, they want to suppress that part of themselves very, very deeply. They don't want to allow to there's a part of themselves that feels that way, even in adulthood, which is very, very deep now. Okay, so now what would that mean? How does the godly soul feel about separation from Hashem? It feels power, it, it feels exposed, it feels vulnerable, it feels threatened. It feels like it ha- like, like it, it can't handle that under any circumstances. Does that feel like love? Right. If we were to think about words that go together with love, right? Desire, comfort, closeness, warmth. Does that feel like that? It feels like the opposite. It feels like the opposite. And yet, strangely, what is underlying that feeling is love. love right? So this idea that the love actually, in a weird way, can, not all types of love, contain its opposite. When the love is to something which is existential, which is anchors my very sense of my own being, then separation from that feels like the dread of death itself. And so the experience of love and the experience of fear are diametrically opposite, but in terms of how they're rooted in the soul, it's one thing. And so if we're tapping into that essential bond that our soul has with the Shem, then are we tapping into a basis of love or a basis of fear or both? Both. And therefore, if love is what's required in our service of Hashem, we have a basis for that. If fear for what's required in our service of Hashem, we have the same basis for that. Okay, questions? Okay, now, a little bit of how this is going to play out. The, the next bit of this chapter um, is going to discuss this idea of the fear and how it plays out in terms of how we relate to sinful behavior. But it's going to deal with a specific issue, which is our ability to rationalize things. Okay? One of the things that the um, Spirit of Father does is one of the ways that the sensation works is rationalizing. Now, I want to talk a little bit about rationalizing and um, how to deal with rationalizing. Rationalizing is when you make an argument that something that makes sense as a way of feeling more comfortable with it. Okay. For instance, let's say you really want something, but you don't you don't feel comfortable asking your friend for it, right? So you can start telling yourself that your friend really wants it. And if your friend really wants it, then asking your friend is really you're helping out your friend, right? So you're like, you really want to go out for pizza, but you don't feel comfortable like right? Dragging your friend after pizza because that makes you seem kind of selfish in your own eyes. So you start to say, hey, my friend really wants to go after pizza. So me asking them for pizza is really about being, being nice to them, and now I can be more accepting of, of it, and then I go and do it. Is that being honest with yourself? Mm-hmm. No. Do we do this all the time? Who is the person that we rationalize for the most? Ourselves. ourselves right? Sometimes we do it for other people, but mostly we do it for ourselves. Now, when you're rationalizing, you're trying to make something, it's supposed to make sense. And so you know, there's kind of like, it's, what, it's rational, it's reasonable, it's supposed to make sense. But it, but it doesn't really make sense. So how, when, how should a person deal with rationalizing? So one, one possibility is you could just get into an argument with yourself, right? You rationalize something and then you counter that. What's the problem with that? Why, why is, why is like, Trying to unreason your rationalization not an effective strategy. In general, why is that an effective strategy? Well, what? Like, if you're fighting yourself, like, there's no way. Like, well, I wish that would be the case. That would be better. But actually, it usually is one. The reasons like this. The part of you, let's imagine like this. Let's imagine you're having a debate with someone, and the person you're debating is very good at rhetoric and wordplay and twisting things out of context. Like, I don't know, say, some politician or a lawyer. And you're just a very sincere, straightforward person. And you're having a debate with them. Are you going to win? No. 
What if you have all the right arguments and everything they're saying is total lies? You're still going to lose. Why? Because you don't know how to You don't know how to. You don't know how right. You don't. You don't know how to do that. You don't know how to twist things. You just know how to be direct. And so what ends up happening is when you try to outwit the rationalization, the part of us that rationalizes its expertise is twisting things that are false into making them seem like they're true. So no matter what you say, what will it do? It'll rationalize that. Right? You're just giving it. You're just. You're just helping it rationalize more. This is an interesting thing. Who's better at rationalizing? Generally, smarter people, meaning more intellectually gifted people, or dumber people, meaning people who are more intellectually simplistic and are hard to follow and sophisticated arguments. Who's better than that? It's strange in thing. People who are not so intellectually gifted, not so smart, tend um, to spot rationalization within themselves better and not rationalize as much. Do you know why? Because they're not good at it. <laughs> You're not good at it. Because on, like, on the surface of it, it just it's not true. It's just, you know, if it's plain forwardly not true, then it's not true. Like, what are you supposed to say? But if, you, if you're if you very, very smart and clever and creative and can use all sorts of tricks and language and all sorts of things, then what can you do? You can twist anything to mean anything. Yeah, there, there, was, there, was, there was a statement of our sages that it says that the really wise sages could find 150 reasons why an impure animal is pure. Now why 150? It's an interesting number. So it says that there are 50 gates of understanding. So there's 50 ways of thinking about anything. Okay. And we know that the Torah has four levels of interpretation. Pshat, then it's Jewish. So Pshat is straightforward meaning. Rem is the, the, the alluded to meaning. Jewish. The, um, the deeper meaning, and so the mystical meaning. So, 50 for each level of understanding, times four levels of understanding gives you how many? 200. 200, but they can only come up with how many reasons why the impure animal is pure? 150. 150, because on the level of shot, it says straightforward in the verse, the animal is impure. Like, there's nothing to do with that. If you're just going to be straightforward about it, there's no room to twist in this, right? But once you're no longer on the level of the shot, you're no longer on the level of straightforward meaning, now you're being clever, there's no end to cleverness. So, what's the solution then to rational when a person when a person's rationalizing things? To come up with an explanation of why the rationalization is wrong? Or just to be honest that that's a rationalization? So you can use an analogy. If someone's bluffing when you're playing poker and you know that they're bluffing, does that give you power over them? They're pretending they have a really good hand. They don't have a good hand. For some reason, you know that. Right? Because now you can decide to just call their bluff, right? But on the other hand, if you don't know that they're bluffing, maybe they really do have a good hand. Now you have to decide is their hand really better than yours? You don't know. Ah, so that's what's going to happen. What the altar is going to do is say this. Before you get to the situation where you rationalize things, you need to know how to recognize the rationalization for what it is. And once you are able to recognize it for what it is, you don't get into an argument with it at the moment. What do you do? You say, well, that's just rationalist. Like, I know that's not true. In other words, you have to learn to recognize that's what's happening before it happens. Does that make sense? By the way, this is not just true about rationalism. It's also true about other things. Like, for instance, like this is something that exists in cognitive behavioral therapy. There's, there's, there's something called ca catastrophizing. It's a little similar. Catastrophizing is that the mind interprets every bad thing as the end of the world. And then, if you're really smart, you come up with very creative arguments as to justify how it's the end of the world. Okay. What is a very helpful thing when your mind is catastrophizing? It's just to say, oh, that's catastrophizing, and catastrophizing is not a reliable way of dealing with things, and just ignore it. You recognize it, and you decide that it's not going to, to determine how you're going to relate to the situation. But in order to do that, you need to recognize it for what it is, right? So that's where a person not in the situation has to learn what does catastrophizing sound like, what does catastrophizing really like, how is it, does it make sense, not really true, outside of that context. So with rationalizing. You need to explore the rationalization, not when you're rationalizing, so you recognize it for what it is, and then when you see it for what is happening, right, you say, no, that's just the... The spirit of folly trying to rationalize away 
um, you know, my, my insensitivity. And I know that's what it is. So I'm not going to get into a debate with it. I'm just going to call the bluff and make, the, make a different decision. And so it follows for a good part of the chapter going forward is examining the way the spirit of folly tries to rationalize and explaining why it's false. But the key thing to understand is it's not, we're not trying to learn how to have that argument at the moment, in the moment a person is faced with the temptations or whatever. We're learning how to now, in the safety of a classroom, in the safety of you know, um, you know, time for contemplation, meditation, to learn to recognize that about ourselves. So that in the moment, we just recognize, well, that's a bluff. That, that's just right. That's just that's nonsense. I know that that's nonsense. And the minute I know that it's nonsense, I decide to treat it as nonsense. Okay? But if you are kind of in a situation, you feel conflicted, you start trying to argue with yourself about, is this, you know, is, is this really true? Is this not really true? What ends up happening? It's like when you're in bed and you need to get up. You start having to argue with yourself. Should you really get up? and get up? How much longer can you sleep? So you end up getting out of bed as a result of that. No, that's a good way. In fact, it says in the Code of Jewish Law, how quickly you're supposed to get up and out of bed in the morning before that conversation starts happening. Because it says once that conversation in your head starts happening, you're not getting out of bed for a while. Right? So you need to recognize it for what it is and say, right? it's like a sleazy salesman. You recognize you're a sleazy salesman, you don't start having a conversation with them. But you need to know how to recognize that. So that's what we want to start tomorrow. Okay. Yep. How to recognize the, the, the rationalization that the spirit of folly uses to keep its hold of us. When we recognize it, we can just decide to call it for what it is. And when are we going to talk about what the spirit of folly actually is? Chapter 24. We're speaking about how to check us out. We need to read out the chapter. Backwards? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Chapter 24 spoke about what it was, and that's and, and how it's that that enables us to sin. And now chapter 25 is all about how we get rid of it. By the way, that's what we're going to talk about. Does how we know how to You have to be able to recognize it. So yeah, how, do, how can you recognize something if you don't know what it is? Well. Uh, I'll, you know that um, in the hospital or in the doctor's office, they have that little, um, usually orange can that has the little biohazard symbol on it. It says biohazard. Okay. Now, what's really important that you know that containers with that symbol on it, you shouldn't stick your hand in it, right? It's dangerous. Do you need to understand how viruses work? No, but you do need to recognize that it's a biohazard. You really need to understand the metaphysics of how the spirit of folly comes about and how it, no, what you need to do is realize that what danger it poses and how to deal with it. I'm not saying it's not an interesting topic of curiosity, but, but in the context of the time, which is really about how to live life, you don't really need a, 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 a deep explanation. You just need to know that there is this thing, this is its effect, this is how to recognize it, this is how to get deal with it, and then you go on and live life where you're supposed to. But if y'all there puts an explanation of what a rapture this is, then it is essential. That's true. So you're just talking about it. What? Like, what does it look like? Rapture is a is a, is a kind of clip, and that's what the explanation gives it. So it's, it's in the context. Um, it, it, it's in the context of dealing with the question. Um, which this goes back to chapter 24. Very, very briefly. Chlipa, unholy things, are experienced by the godly soul in a way that we would experience things like um, vomit and feces, other things like that, which is they're uh, disgusting, they're utterly repulsive, and we have like an abhorrence from that we just cannot bear, right? Okay, add to that the sense of existential threat that goes along with it, right? So, now, the question therefore was, how is it possible then for a Jew ever to sin? And the answer is, Klippa has another aspect to which it was the desensitizing quality of the Rosh So it's an, so it's putting it in the context of an aspect of Klippa of enabling us to sin, but like a deeper explanation of beyond that, right? You don't you don't really you don't you don't really have there. Now, 
if you then take that piece of information and you have a deeper understanding of what creep is existentially, blah, 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 you can figure some stuff out. And it's very interesting in the context of learning to the sake of learning to maybe it's very important, but in the context of learning to know how to like, serve God and live a proper Jewish life, right, what I need to know is that Klippa not just is ungodly, not just causes the first temptation to sin, it also has this other quality, and that's the quality that we have to address, which is the, the desensitizing quality. Because if you, can, if you can address that, it doesn't matter how strong the desire is to sin, you're never going to sin. If, if, no matter how strong the desire is to sin, it feels like sin, or you recognize that sinning is like is an existential issue for you, you won't do it. So the Tzorach element that needs to be isolated out of the Klippa, that spirit of desensitization and follow of stupidity has to be understood in terms of the role that it plays, but it is just an aspect of the genuine of Klippa. And there is a there's a philosophical question that we could ask about it, which the Alter begins at, which becomes relevant later on in the later chapter of time, the Alter addresses that as well. Um, so could it be like anything that takes that separate from God? Well, the, the Rashtus is very specific. It doesn't separate you from Godliness, it makes you forget how much you love Hashem and the effect of doing mitzvahs in the world. It, that's, what, that's what it does. Um, you're not conscious of what you're bringing up. Yeah, it makes you not conscious of what you're bringing up. And, and the thing is, and, and this is why you actually have real authority over it, right? You don't have real authority to remove your ungodly desire. I, from now on, I will never desire to sin. You don't actually have that kind of authority. There's actually, you have authority about certain things. But the Rosh you actually do have authority because the Rosh is is, 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 is distorting your own sense of yourself. It's not adding ungodly elements to yourself. In other words, if you were a perfectly righteous person, you would only have godly desires. If you're a perfectly ungodly person, you only have ungodly desires. But if you're a Jew, then you have both, right? Okay, correct. But the godly things are much more powerful than ungodly things, so I should always be doing godly things. It's the it's the desensitization, the the, the being kind of alienated from yourself, not being not being in touch with yourself. That element, that's what's that's true, and that actually you do have control over. But like having a deeper understanding of the metaphysics is irrelevant. What he does say earlier on is yes, that's an aspect of the klipa, but we're highlighting that because that's the one that's relevant. You don't actually need to get rid of your inclination and your ungodly desires to serve God properly, because the godly side is actually fundamentally. Stronger, more, more essential to our identity than the ungodly side, as long as we're going to be honest about it with ourselves. So if it, that's the thing, you don't really need to know how the virus and bacteria work to know that this is dangerous, as long as you know how to identify them and so be able to learn to how to identify. So that's what we're saying. So that's what So this was coming now in chapter twenty-five. It's not a way to argue the rush just out of your mind. It's something that's a way to recognize that when you start hearing your mind say things that sound like a variation of this, that's, you recognize that that's rationalization. And the way you deal with rationalization is call it for what it is. And decide not to live according to it. Which is simple, it's not necessarily easy, but it's simple. Good? Thank you. So, that's Thank you.